All right. Well, as everyone's getting situated in snacks, I did just want to jump right in and make the most of our time together. It's so good to be with you. First Wednesday nights are my favorite night of the month. I don't know about you, but it certainly is for me. So I'm so glad you braved the cold weather and the wet weather and you came to join us tonight. I pray that God warms your heart with his word and community. So tonight we're gathering around this woven woman of the Bible for November. Her story does connect directly to Caro's story. Once again, we have a woman who is not assigned a proper name in the scriptures, but by now we have learned, I hope, that God knows her name. He sees her, he cares for her, he carries her and has great plans and a purpose for her life. He's given us her story to be able to read today. So she matters, and in the same way you matter before God. You're named and known and cared for and carried by God. He has a plan and a purpose for your life, that he is raising you up to walk in, hand in hand with him. I, feel, I pray that at Woven, you feel equipped and empowered to do just that. So tonight, our Woven woman of the Bible, unfortunately, her nickname, you may have heard it, it's not the best, I would not ask for it myself, but she's nicknamed the Bleeding Woman in Mark chapter five. And so she is our woven woman of the Bible for November, but we kind of get a two for one special this month because her story is sandwiched between the story of Jairus's daughter. And you cannot hear the bleeding woman's story without hearing the story of Jairus's daughter. The two were always intended to be told together. And so we're gonna do that tonight. We'll be in Mark chapter five, verses 21 through 43. I'll be reading from the New Living Translation, which I read from last month. Does the best job of sharing her story this month, I think. And so you can read along with me. We're just listening and enjoy story time like we do. But I'll give you a little background before we jump in because this story starts in a really abnormal way. As Jesus goes across a lake in a boat, gets out of the boat, onto the shore, and there's a crowd of people, and you're wondering, well, what's happening? So Mark chapter five begins with the story of Jesus encountering a man who fittingly, as we come out of Halloween, this man lived in a cemetery and he was possessed by demons. So many evil spirits, it's creepy. Jesus asks, what's your name? And he says, my name is Legion for we are many. And he sends out these evil spirits into about 2,000 pigs. Can you imagine enough evil spirits to fill 2,000 pigs being possessed by that, that's horrific. So Jesus meets him, frees him completely. The community is astounded that he's cool, calm, and collected. They're terrified. Jesus gets in a boat to go to the other side of the lake, and this formerly demon-possessed man who's now been healed by Jesus wants to go with Jesus. And Jesus says, no, go home to your friends and your family. Tell everybody what God has done for you and how he's shown you mercy. Tell everybody who God is and what he's done for you, right? And he does just that. So this is what's happened in Mark 5 before we jump in. So let's go. Mark chapter 5, verse 21. Jesus got into the boat again and went back to the other side of the lake where a large crowd gathered around him on the shore. Then a leader of the local synagogue, whose name was Jairus, arrived. When he saw Jesus... He fell at his feet, pleading fervently with him. My little daughter is dying, he said. Please come and lay your hands on her. Heal her so she can live. Jesus went with him, and all the people followed, crowding around him. A woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding. She'd suffered a great deal from many doctors, and over the years, she'd spent everything she had to pay them. But she'd gotten no better. In fact, she'd gotten worse. She had heard about Jesus. So she came up behind him through the crowd and touched his robe. For she thought to herself, if I can just touch his robe, I'll be healed. Immediately, the bleeding stopped. And she could feel in her body that she'd been healed of her terrible condition. Jesus realized at once that healing power had gone out from him, so he turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my robe? His disciples said to him, look at this crowd pressing around you. How can you ask who touched me? But he kept on looking around to see who had done it. 
Then the frightened woman, trembling at the realization of what had happened to her, came, fell to her knees in front of him, and told him what she had done. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Your suffering is over. While he was still speaking to her, messengers arrived from the home of Jairus, the leader of the synagogue. They told him, your daughter's dead. There's no use troubling the teacher now. But Jesus overheard them and said to Jairus, don't be afraid. Just have faith. Then Jesus stopped the crowd and wouldn't let anyone go with him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw much commotion and weeping and wailing. He went inside and asked, why all this commotion and weeping? The child isn't dead. She's only asleep. The crowd laughed at him, but he made them all leave. And he took the girl's father and mother and his three disciples into the room where the girl was lying. Holding her hand, he said to her, Talitha kum, which means, little girl, get up. And the girl, who was 12 years old, immediately stood up and walked around. They were overwhelmed and totally amazed. Jesus gave him strict orders not to tell anyone what had happened. And then he told them to give her something to eat. Such a powerful story. Every month it's a powerful story, but I just love this one. And can you see already how they're meant to be told together? The story of the bleeding woman and Jairus' daughter. Did you catch? Jairus' daughter is just 12 years old and she's dying. And this woman in the crowd has suffered from constant bleeding for 12 years since Jairus' daughter was born and he held that baby in his arms. This woman has suffered. It's been relentless suffering without relief. We don't know what her life looked like before she met Jesus this day. But we know that she spent all she had on doctors trying and trying and trying to get better. But she didn't get better. She only got worse. And now she's left with seemingly nothing. So the story begins with Jairus. He's a leader of a local synagogue. He's a man in a position of power, especially when it comes to religion. So he comes before Jesus, falls on his knees before him, begs, pleads with him fervently, Jesus, will you come to my house? Lay your hands on my little girl, she's dying. So Jesus agrees, he comes. They're on their way to Jairus' house. And what happens? They meet this woman, right? They're passing through a crowd. And we see in this story that the woman comes to Jesus, but I would argue that Jesus passes by her, that he knew that she was in that crowd. Fully believe that. So he comes by, and I don't know what this woman had heard about Jesus to you, that she believed, she'd heard enough about Jesus that she believed if she could just touch the edge of his robe, she'd be healed. What audacious faith. Wouldn't you be tired? 12 years of bleeding out with no relief. It's only gotten worse. I'm left with nothing. In that community, she would have been ostracized and shunned because she was unclean. No one could touch her. People would not associate her with her. So not only is she suffering physically, but socially, she's alone. And yet she has the audacity to believe that Jesus could heal her. If she would just touch the edge of his robe, where does that come from? So Jesus passes by. And she presses through the crowd to touch the edge of his robe, believing if I can just touch it, I'll be healed. And she does. But don't you wonder what that looked like? This crowd pressing in from every direction. As she pressed through, do you think she was fighting through and people were kind of disgusted? Do you think they didn't notice? Do you think maybe they were so aware of her condition that the way just kind of was paved before her, like when the water split? We don't know. We weren't there. But it took a whole lot of courage for her to press through that crowd, come up behind Jesus and touch his rope. But do you notice she comes up behind Jesus? Not in front, behind. It seems fitting. This woman who's 
been shunned and ostracized by her community. I assume not only does she feel invisible, but she probably tries to be invisible. I would imagine it's better to be invisible than to be shunned, wouldn't it be? I don't know. So discreetly, she pushes through, touches the edge of his robe from behind, goes off. Well, obviously, Jesus immediately feels this healing power go out from him. He knows that someone's been healed. And I would argue he's not just fully man. He is fully God. And so he knows who's been healed. He doesn't need to figure that out. And yet, he asks, who touched me? And his disciples, I love them. They always tell us just the real truth, right? They tell us what, we would, what I would say. Jesus, Y'all, I've been to Disney World at Christmas, and I feel like that was this moment. It is jam-packed. Jesus, there's crowds pressing in left and right. How could you possibly ask who touched me? And yet, Jesus shakes that off, keeps looking around, trying to see who did it. He knew who did it, but he wants to see her face to face. He's got so much more healing and hope for her than she could ever imagine. So there's this beautiful thing that happens. She could run from Jesus, but she doesn't. Don't you imagine she's afraid? This woman wasn't supposed to be touched by anybody. This incredible teacher who the religious leader of the synagogue believed could heal his own daughter, that he left his daughter on her deathbed in those final moments to run to this teacher that he would heal her. She's gone and touched his robe. What's going to happen? Nevertheless, in her fear and trembling, overwhelmed that she's been healed after 12 years of constant suffering, she comes before Jesus, before him, not behind, falls on her knees before him and tells him the whole truth about what happened. What is that? She tells him her story, not just for Jesus to hear, but for everybody to hear. See, Jesus always wanted her to be before him face to face. She takes the same posture that Jairus took just on the shore when he pleaded with Jesus, my little daughter is dying, will you come and lay your hands on her? Now this woman is in the same posture. What does Jesus say? Well, first off, he looks at her. He looks at her. Don't you wonder when the last time is that somebody really saw her? How kind of God. He looks at her and he calls her daughter. I'm going to sit there for a second. He calls her daughter. Don't you wonder, in 12 years of constant suffering, when's the last time someone called her daughter? You see, you've got Jairus' daughter here who's 12 years old. She's dying, and her daddy is coming to plead and advocate for her healing. But who does this woman have? She's not assigned a name in the scriptures. She's suffering. She's left with nothing. She's alone. She has no one to advocate for her until Jesus hits the scene. Jesus is her advocate. He fills that role in her life. He calls her daughter. And in so doing amongst this crowd of people that's gathering to see the miracles Jesus is doing, he restores her dignity. He restores her place in society. But most importantly, he shows her who he is. He's not just the healer. He's the hope. He's the father. He's the family. He's the friend. He's the rescue we've always needed. He shows her. Y'all, this is the God we worship, but he doesn't stop there. He says, daughter, your faith has made you well. What? I thought it was the robe. No, honey. Your faith has made you well. Did y'all know that God designed us as people Women and men, children and up. He designed us to have faith in God, to believe in God, truly. We are not whole, well, and healed until we place our faith and belief in Jesus. Not just for salvation, but if you have not yet said said yes to Jesus for salvation, may tonight be the night of your salvation. But it's throughout life. You see, we feel broken when we stop trusting him. We feel broken when we no longer believe who he is and what he can do for us. We feel broken when we forget that God is our father and we are his daughter. He is for us. He's never against us. So he says, your faith has made you well. Y'all, what faith do you need to show before Jesus today? What do you need to believe? He's just asking you, believe. Believe. Believe in me. I'm your healer, I'm your help, and I'm your hope. You can trust me. She's been bleeding out for 12 years, trying to find healing and hope in everything but Jesus. 
Praise the Lord she hadn't given up yet because she finally finds it in him. Y'all, I'm guilty of this. In my own suffering, in my own struggles, in my own weakness, in my own doubts and questions and frustrations, I look for everything but Jesus to fill me and it never does. It comes up short every time, whether it's something or someone, it cannot heal us like Jesus can. Praise God, he's so gracious to always bring me back to him, to learn that. This is our life. Would we look eyes on him at the one who calls his daughter? As he says, your faith has made you well. And he doesn't stop there. He says, your suffering is over. Can y'all imagine? 12 years. I cannot express it enough. I just turned 32, okay? 12 years to be suffering since I was 20? You gotta be kidding me. (laughs) And getting worse and losing everything in the process suffering and suffering and Jesus says her your suffering is over because Jesus suffers for us and he suffers with us but suffering doesn't look the same when we're held by the Lord most high even the darkness is light to him he calms the storm because he's with us he's with us honey your suffering is over I'm here don't you imagine I didn't plan on sharing this very briefly. I'll say I remember when I was in high school, I had a boyfriend who cheated on me and it was one of the greatest pains I'd experienced at that point, that pain of betrayal. And I was in Arlington, my family lived in McKinney and I remember I was just so torn up, I didn't feel like I could drive home. And my dad came and picked me up and I hugged him so tight. My dad came to save me. He did the same when I came home from a really stormy season in Amsterdam and felt more broken than I have ever felt thus far. Who picked me up at the airport? My dad. He hugged me. There's something special about when your father calls your daughter. He's here with us. Your suffering's over. And then he says, go in peace. Notice he doesn't say, go find peace. Go have peace. Peace be with you. He says, go in peace. The peace of Christ that surpasses all understanding, that guards our hearts and minds, souls and spirits in Christ Jesus. Go in peace. Go with me. We were created to live in Christ Jesus. And in so doing, we can live in peace, even in the midst of the chaos, in the midst of this crowd pressing in. Go in peace. Daughter, Your faith has made you well. Your suffering is over. Go in peace. I pray you hear that tonight. But the story doesn't end there, does it? No, Jesus was on his way to do something. So while Jesus is talking to her, remember he's fully man but fully God. So he's capable of doing what I can't do. He's overhearing this conversation with Jairus. Messengers from his house come and they say, your daughter's dead. No use bothering the teacher now. But Jesus interrupts, he intervenes. He still does that today. He wants to do it with you tonight, I believe. He interrupts and intervenes. And he says, Jairus, don't be afraid. Just have faith. Just believe. Hello, he just did this with the woman. Your faith has made you well. He just healed this woman. Jairus wants him to come lay his hands on his daughter so she'll be healed He just healed this woman and he never even touched her. Just the edge of his robe. Just have faith. This just happened, Jairus. Eyes on me. We're going. Jesus does this with me all the time. Does he do it with you? You're trusting him to do something for you. It seems like he's forgotten about it. Um, God, did you see me? And meanwhile, we look around and it seems like he's answering everybody's prayer but ours. Let him interrupt you. Don't be afraid. Just have faith. Keep walking, right? We're going. He's still going. But I just imagine what Jairus was feeling in that moment. Again, he left his daughter when she's dying to come to bring him to heal her. Now his daughter's dead. Don't you think he's wondering, if you had not stopped for whoever that woman was, we would have made it in time. I'm sure he's fuming, heartbroken. I would be. Jesus. Why did you stop? But don't you see, Jesus was unwilling to leave that place until he was face to face with that woman. 
until he had that encounter with her. He would not move forward to Jairus' house until that happened. Do you see the connection with Kara's story earlier? So they're going. He's like, don't be afraid, just have faith. He doesn't have the crowd go with him. He only takes three of his disciples, which is interesting, but it's really his inner circle, which is a good picture for us of friendship and investment in other people. He has, you know, disciples a dozen plus other women that he invests in, but he's got this inner circle of three. Who is your inner circle, I wonder? But he brings them with Jairus, with Jairus and they're going to his house to heal his daughter. He gets there and it's this whole big scene of weeping and wailing, understandably so. How terrible that this 12-year-old girl of this religious leader would die. Why would that happen? But Jesus walks in and he says, why all the commotion? Why all the weeping? She's not dead. She's only sleeping. And they say, what? Well, they don't really say anything, do they? They just laugh at him. They mock him. They chastise him. And he doesn't care. He shakes it off because he knows who he is and he knows what he's there to do. And what he could have done if he was a little bit more like me and he wanted to defend himself and his reputation, but praise him, he's God, not me. He could have said, oh, y'all just wait. Come on up. This girl who's dead is about to come, by, come to life and we'll see who's laughing now. That's not the character of the God we worship, is it? No, he sends the crowds off. He takes his three disciples, Jairus and his wife, the little girl's mother. They go up to the room. They see the little girl there dead. He walks up and holds her by the hand says Talitha Kum, which is Aramaic for little girl, get up. She gets up, walks around. He says, get her something to eat and don't tell anybody this happened. Everybody's amazed, what? And you might be confused, why did he say don't tell anybody this happened? But it's in Mark, and in Mark's gospel, you'll see something called the messianic secret, which means it's pretty normal when Jesus does miracles for him to say don't tell anybody. And it's not that, people, that he doesn't want people to know who he is, I really think it's so he can prolong the ministry he has here on earth because you see what his healing and miracles cost him, right? He gets killed, executed for it. He's hated. So he says, don't tell anyone about it. But that's not the point of the story. No, the point of the story is that Jesus heals. He gives hope. He advocates for us. He cares about the 12-year-old little girl whose daughter pleads for her healing. He cares for this bleeding woman who suffered and nameless and forgotten and ostracized and left alone. He cares for them both. He cares for Jairus. Did you see that? He doesn't chastise Jairus. He's patient. He interrupts. Okay, y'all friends, you're saying he can't bug me. Bug me all you want, Jairus. Don't be afraid. Just have faith. Do you catch this? So many miracles in this story. This is the God that we worship. This is him. These are real stories for us today. Where are you tonight? Where have you been bleeding out, trying to find healing and hope in everything but Jesus? He wants to be it for you tonight. Or are you feeling like Jairus where you're like, God, I really felt like you were doing this for me, but now it just seems like we were put on pause and I just wonder, are you ever gonna come back and notice me? Maybe you're like this little girl. You just feel dead inside. But he's like, no, honey, you're not dead. You're just sleeping. Little girl, get up. Walk with me. Walk closely with me. Get something to eat. Be a walking miracle as people are amazed by how I work and move and live and be in you and through you. There's so much for us to take from this story that is about women, yes, but mostly it's about Jesus. I pray every month here at Woven, you fall more in love with the God who gave us this word, who loves you. So as we split for teaching and table talks, I've got one question for you. You'll notice we ask it a lot, there's a reason. How do you see your story in this woman's story. Talk amongst your tables for about 10 minutes and then we'll wrap up. All right. 
I know, I know, this is my least favorite moment of the night is when I have to say, okay, we gotta wrap up, head home. Um, but feel free on your way out to, if you're in a conversation, continue your conversation. I'm not kicking you out completely and we still have plenty of popcorn I see and drinks, so take some for your kids or um, your significant other or your friend or whoever it may be, just take a bunch for yourself. I mean, I like to eat popcorn myself. Kettle corn's my personal favorite. Um, but it has been so good to have you here tonight, truly. Um, we're gathering again next month, December 1st, first Wednesday and first day of December, and I'm excited as we get together. I am a big fan of Christmas, um, but I am honoring Thanksgiving tonight, okay? But <laughs> Christmas is coming. Hallmark movies are here. All the fun things, so come bring all your Christmas spirit. We'll be back with bilingual worship together. It's going to be a really good time. I do hope that you'll bring somebody with you. As you can see, we still have room and we're gathering around God's word and together and I just believe that every woman in Dallas can benefit from our time together. I pray that you are. I'm so glad you're here and know that I'm praying for you throughout the month. Uh, so on that note, I'll pray us out. God, thank you for just being who you are and thank you for showing us who you are through your word and through one another as we share these stories with one another. I really believe that every story in the Bible relates to the story of Jesus, the gospel that's the power of salvation for all who believe, and every one of our life stories also relates to you, Jesus, as we are created in the image of God to know you personally. So I thank you for this time together as we can process through different life experiences and how you've always had your eye on us, you've always been pursuing us, and you always will. You'll stop at nothing to have all of us. And I thank you for that, Lord Jesus. Forgive us for how we so quickly stray away, but thank you that you always bring us near. So as we go out into this cold night, into this month of November that I'm sure is packed with all kinds of crazy things and good things and hopefully quality time together at the end of the month with Thanksgiving, God, would we seek first quality time with you? Would you wake us up in the morning? and remind us of your presence. Invite us to walk with you. Like that little girl, you held her by the hand. You said, little girl, get up. Would you say that to us when we wake up in the morning? Would you walk with us through the day? And can we come before you, fall on our knees before you, just like that woman at night? Pour out our hearts before you. God, you're always with us. You're for us and never against us. Would you show us the story tonight who do we know who needs to hear it who wasn't in this room? Give us the courage to share it with somebody else for your glory and their good. Amen. Have a great month and I'll see you December 1st. <laughs>